transition to, towards um, a zero waste uh, society. And we're also a network of organization implementing zero waste strategy across Europe at, at the local and national level. Zero Waste Europe is part of the Recent Plastic Alliance and of the Break Free From Plastic uh, movement. And um, today, this webinar on reuse is part of an ongoing uh, Zero Waste Europe live uh, semester. And basically, we're organizing webinars every month um, on a topic related to, uh, to waste and prevention of waste uh, in general. So they run from October to June, so there will be a few more for this uh, season. Uh, and today, today we talk about reuse, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, indeed, we know that the ability to reuse materials, to reuse products really sits at the heart of achieving a zero waste society and, and really a prerequisite to a secular economy. Reuse has received more and more uh, attention recently. Um, more and more initiatives are coming to try to replace some of the single use packaging, for example, with reusable solutions. Big companies are also talking about it more and more. We see decision makers uh, really wanting to make uh, sustainable products, reusable products a priority and the new norm in Europe. And so that's great to see this consensus and this attention given to reuse. And, and today what we want to look at is how do we make that happen? Now there's this willingness to do it. How do we concretely make that happen? Um, and how do we make sure it becomes mainstream, it really becomes the norm uh, and it's accessible to all. And that actually requires to rethink some of the products, but also some of the, 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 the systems we live in. And some of the questions we're gonna address today are, what conditions are necessary to make reuse convenient and accessible to all? Um, how can local authorities help? And also how can EU and national decision makers help with their policies to support reuse? And I'm really uh, excited because we have great speakers today. Um, so we will have three presentations today um, from Clarissa Morski, Chief Executive Officer at Reloop. Uh, then we'll hear from Tobias Bilenstein, um, who is sustainability and communication. Um, so sustainability and communication uh, Director of Public Affairs of the German Mineral Waters Company. Sorry about that, Tobias. And Inge Leighton, uh, who's with the recycling network Benelux. Um, so how it's gonna run, we'll have a bit less than 90 minutes together now. We will give 10 minutes for each presentation. And then after each presentation, there will be about 10 minutes for a quick Q&A. And we'll keep uh, 20 to 30 minutes at the end of the webinar for a discussion with all panelists, uh, et cetera. So how can you uh, contribute to this webinar? So first of all, you can introduce yourself in the chat uh, if you wish to. Um, and my colleague Rosella, that you cannot see, but is here, will uh, share information and links in the chat as well during the presentations of the speakers. And then for questions, we will use uh, a Q&A, uh, the Q&A section. So you can just uh, use and, and raise your question in a Q&A. Uh, the panelists may answer to them in written form directly, and we will also take them um, and respond to them um, during the last Q&A session. And um, because we were limited today uh, with Zoom and there was so much interest from you, we're actually live on YouTube as well. Um, so if you are actually following this webinar on YouTube, you can also use the chat uh, on YouTube to ask your question and we'll make sure to, to monitor that as well. Um, so that's for today, uh, exciting. Um, and then I think we can start with our first speaker, uh, Clarissa. So Clarissa um, Moreski has been working with the industry, with industry government and nonprofit organization for uh, decades now. She brings more than 25 years of technical and analytical and communication expertise in waste reduction policies and, and operations. She's principal of CM Consulting since 1998 and um, was a co-founder of Reloop in 2019. And Clarissa works with members and like-minded uh, entities to develop smart, practical and effective policy recommendation in Europe and uh, since last year also in North America as part of her work uh, with Reloop. Clarissa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Justine. I hope you can hear me okay, everybody. Yeah, good. Okay, so I'm going to take everybody on a bit of a whirlwind tour over the next 10 minutes uh, and sort of try to cover the first bit of, of what we're going to talk about today. And it starts with who Reloop is. And I just want to put up this one graphic. 
Reloop, uh, we were actually founded in 2015 in Europe, and now we're, uh, we've expanded to North America and the Pacific region, and we focus on these five issues. Um, and as you'll see, our reuse revolution program is really about, uh, we have a network of um, all of the value chain, those entities like Tobias, like Zero Waste Europe, NGOs that are working on reuse. So we're, we're always happy to hear from you, and particularly we're interested in um, pilots and technologies to we can advance reuse and understanding what we need to do to get the system conditions in place to really see reuse grow. Um, but if you need more information on Reloop, go to our website. There's an audio visual that takes you through these five key issues, which are of course all interrelated. But let's get back to basics. So here's the traditional hierarchy. Um, you can Google hierarchy on online and this is basically what you're gonna get. This is the right hierarchy. Um, and where we clearly have reuse ahead of recycling and recycling ahead of energy recovery or recovery of any of any any nature. So the real question then when we talk about reuse is understanding why reuse sits above recycling in 99.9% .9 of the times. And we're gonna walk you through that. So this was the question that both Zero Waste Europe and Reloop asked ourselves is, you know, what what, what makes reuse, why is it higher in the hierarchy? And what we decided to do we was collaborated on a project that wanted to take a look at what are the differences between single use and refillable or reusable packaging from a life cycle assessment perspective? Why is it that reuse is so much better than recycling? We created this um, report that we worked on with the University of Utrecht and the life cycle assessment experts from the university. And here are, is basically what the report tells us. So the first thing you need to understand when we're talking about reuse is there's different types of reusable models. There's the refillable, refillable by bulk dispenser, which is what you see here, which is also an area of growth. We're hearing more about grocery stores that are considering packaging free aisles where they can deliver bulk distribution through newer types of technologies, touchless, that automatically measure where you can bring your own container in, you don't have peanuts falling over everywhere and you're using spoons and the old kind of concept. So that's definitely something that we're very, very keen to look at. The other one is where you have parent packaging refill programs. So this is where you have a, let's say a big bottle at home and then you bring a, a smaller bottle from the store and you, or a big bottle up from the store and you refill your smaller bottle at home. We don't see them that often, but every once in a while, you'll see an opportunity to take a, like a diluted, a non-diluted product, bring it home and then add water and, and effectively put it in a larger package. Then you've got returnable packaging. And the, and the best example of this are of course, refillable bottles, but more and more we're seeing coffee cup programs to go packaging food. And of course, everybody has heard of Loop where they do more individual packages um, but again, it's a delivery system and all of the containers are reusable. Now, the thing that you need to understand with these kinds of programs is there's generally speaking, some entity owns the refillable package, whether it's owning the bottle, owning all of the cups, owning all of these uh, reusable salad containers. We call them a reusable asset and there's an owner and that owner ensures that those packages are coming back. Because if you're going to make a high value reusable package, you wanna make sure that you can get them back. And then the final big area of reuse is of course, transportation packaging. Now you might say, well, this is already happening. There's some pictures here below, but I can tell you that there is a lot more growth that needs to occur. We do do a lot of reusable packaging for fruits and vegetables, but we're still not doing it a lot for packing meat, packing fish, where of course you, it's either reusable fish boxes or it's these styrofoam boxes on fishing trawlers that often do blow into the sea. So there's still a lot of opportunity to build out reusable packaging, which actually can last sort of 16, 17 years beyond the market. So it's a really, really good uh, area to look at. So that looks at all of the different types of packaging. Our study looked at studies that investigated reusable packaging, all these different types we found about 35 studies and our researchers at University of Utrecht looked into deep, deep detail into what makes different packagings better and why. And without going into details of the study, but you can certainly go and look on the Zero Waste Europe website or the Reloop website and read into it. But I want you to give you the four key findings. First of all, what we discovered was that the thing 
you have to understand when you're looking at a packaging, any packaging, is what is the footprint of the production phase of that packaging, actually making the packaging. Is it glass? If it's glass, how much energy? What's the footprint that goes into making glass? And that footprint is key because tech, traditionally, the production footprint accounts for the vast majority of the total footprint of that product from cradle to grape. So we always need to look at production. The next thing is the number of cycles. So take a glass bottle. It is possible that the production is high energy intense process to make a glass bottle. But if you're reusing that glass bottle 50 times, every time you're using it, you're cutting that production in half by a quarter into an eighth, one sixteenth, and you're very, very much very quickly um, reducing that environmental burden, even though the initial enviro bur environmental burden might have been high, as is the case for glass. Here is a good example of a glass bottle. And you can see that the first production is this much carbon dioxide. And then the second one, you're reducing it. There's always some transportation in there. So after a certain amount of reusable rotations, you actually start to level out. And then the only additional environmental burdens are traditionally um, the transportation piece. So that's also an interesting graphic that we discovered that you don't have to necessarily reuse something 100 times or even 50 times for it to give you a real good environmental um, output. And then finally, uh, so here's the transportation. Obviously transportation can have an impact. Um, weightier items and more voluminous items tend to be more transportation um, heavy, but we can still do a number of things to reduce the transportation. We can have reverse logistics. We can have hub and spoke models. We can um, gasify the fleet in terms of um, moving away from fossil fuel and making electric models. We can optimize routes, et cetera. And the last one is end of life. And that's really focusing on what do we do at the end of the life of the product, whether it's single use or reusable, getting that product properly recycled into a closed loop system is that final incredibly important piece that we have to ensure that is in place, whether it's reusable or single use. But these are sort of the four key areas that we discovered are the primary drivers of the life cycle impact of those products. So when we look at reusables, we have to consider all of these impacts and try to design a reuse system that is favorable on all these key, four key points. And just on the recycling piece, you can see here in yellow is a virgin of production of a virgin bottle, for example, versus the green, which is a recycled bottle. So you can see that end of life is critical because it almost more than half the emissions are um, emitted when you do recycled versus virgin. So that's another very important piece, reusables or single use. So here you have the finals, everything is in the report. These are the system conditions that will determine how environmentally friendly your product is or your package is. Now let's take a quick look at refillables, which is the most common reusable package in the world. And we've just done a study which we're going to be releasing. So keep an eye open for it in the next uh, two weeks on refillables across the world and what is happening to refillables across the world. This is the global overview. And you can clearly see over time that what is going up is non-refillable PET bottles, plastic water bottles, for example, Oh, since 1999, this is a 20 year period. And what is declining is um, refillable glass, which is re represented by the green. This is global, um, but you can still see there's a decline. And that little bit of a decline there is actually very, very significant in terms of billions and billions of units. So as we continue, the focus for refillable containers is very much a focus on deposit return programs. And that is because, as I said originally, one of the primary um, outcomes in terms of environmental efficiency is how much is getting returned. Whether you're reusing something and you need to get more than 99 out of 10 of your units back, or if you're recycling something, it's critically important that you get as many back as possible. So we have an opportunity to really um, grow reuse in Europe because we actually have a number of countries that are introducing deposit return programs on single use containers. And if we can piggyback reusable containers in that system, we have an opportunity to really grow refillables. And here you have the countries that are currently on deposit in Europe, 
the countries that have signed into law deposits in Europe, the countries that are seriously, seriously considering introducing deposits, even though it may not be in law at this very moment. Um, and then you've got others coming in the future. So there's a real opportunity today to start thinking about building these deposit systems that are coming online in a way that they take back both reusables and single use packaging. This is what we call our butterfly graphic, which simply um, shows you that in several countries in Europe where we have refillables, we also collect them back through the same, very same collection points where we take back our single use containers. Here you have a lady who's drinking a container. Um, she can, if it's a single use container, she brings it back to the retailer. She gets her money back. It goes to accounting center, it gets recycled and it gets back into production. If it's refillable. She ships it back to the retailer. He gives her a refund. It gets cleaned, it gets filled and it gets restocked on the retailer. These systems work very well together. Let me give you an example. Here are some actual photographs of systems in Europe where you have both refillables and non-refillables in the same system collected back. And for all intents and purposes, some of the customers that buy these bottles or containers, they don't even necessarily know that they're refillable. This is in Lithuania. This is a front facing customer, what the customer deals with. She can put her refillables in there or she can put her non-refillables in there. They come to a back room, the refillable glass bottles come to the end of the line where the when the employee comes in every couple of hours, that employee hand bombs them into the crates and they get shipped right back to the producer. Here's another example in Estonia, slightly different mechanism where you have what they call a soft drop. The bottles go through the various machines for single use containers. The refillables go off the back slowly, gently, so they don't break. And then they are manually hand bombed into the crates a couple of times a day from the, um, the container at the back. So I just wanted you to see these. This is another one in Finland. I think what's interesting here is the front facing, the consumer facing experience. That is where we really need to focus. We need to make reusing refillables as easy as using single use containers until we make them as easy in terms of handling consumer experience you will not get growth. Consumers will not want to necessarily buy refillables unless you're all members of Zero Waste Europe. And then of course, you're gonna to wanna to buy refillables, but we, the environmentalists are not um, the biggest share of the people in the world. So we really need to make the, the, the action of buying and returning refillables as easy as single use containers as it is in Germany. And you'll be hearing from Tobias later and he can share that experience with you. So in Germany, I can return my single use containers at all shops and I can also return my refillable containers at any shops that sell refillable containers. So with that, I don't have a lot of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carissa, for this presentation. Uh, really good to hear from different experience. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to the report uh, from Reloop that is coming uh, later this, this month. Uh, very interesting. Interesting to hear you say about, you know, you can have reusable products, but it can only work in a, a system that is designed also for collection uh, and the infrastructure that, that goes with it. So basically, you also need to put the infrastructure, the collection and the systems together. Uh, and indeed, the role of making sure it's easy for, for the consumers. And while we collect a few questions, maybe I have one also maybe related to that is that um, also in Europe, the circular economy agenda has been very much put in parallel as well to the digitalization agenda and the role that digitalization can have in supporting the circular economy. Um, in, in the context of reuse, um, what, where do you see uh, the role of, of the digitalization or the digital tools? Yeah, so when we talk about digital digitalization, I mean, the, the most simplistic thing that we can think about is what we call serialized coding. It's effectively giving a, it's like a barcode, but it's a unique barcode. It's usually a number made up of letters and numbers. And it effectively assigns the code to that one reusable asset. And remember that reusable asset is going around and around. So if it has an individual code, we can track that, the activity and the behavior of that individual asset. So for reusable products, where you have a set amount of products that are put on the market by one or two or a coordinated group of industries, you can actually deploy a serialized coding system from the get-go. And you can have that, 
that base of data that can really provide you with the information in terms of where are those materials flowing, which ones are flowing out and not flowing back, et cetera. So that kind of serialized coding has tremendous potential for reuse systems, but so does on more valuable reusable items, um, things like RFID uh, chips, where you can um, have some very specific information embedded in that unit and you can have some tracking through apps and these kinds of things. So I think that where digitalization um, has its real opportunity, it starts with reuse. And again, because we have more control in the system, we can actually deploy the digitalization um, technology without having to go through huge amounts of um, companies like, let's say, brand owners for single-use containers. You know, we can do a digital system for all the single-use packaging, but it's a much more tricky program because you've literally got to interface with every single brand owner that sells packaging into the market. With reusables, it's much simpler because you generally have only a few companies that are engaged in the reusable system. So there is a huge opportunity for digitalization, not only even for reusable packaging, but for reusable products as well. Thanks a lot, Clarissa. And there's now a lot of questions coming. Uh, this is great. Uh, keep them coming. Some of them I will keep for the conversation later, but maybe one. Uh, there's a couple around the role of retailers um, and what can be incentives for retailers and also how can we like boost the implementation of refillable sec uh, sections and, and sessions in, in, in supermarkets. What may be the, the barriers to that if you want to share a few words from your experience working with retailers as well? Well, um, I would say that retailers have absolutely critical role in taking back reusable items and packaging. They have to be included. Uh, we have to make it as easy as possible. It has to be as easy as when I'm going shopping, I can return my units to the store. The idea of having special return centers or depots or in America redemption centers is wrong. It is inequitable. It is generally, these are systems that are good for people with a car or time that they can do the extra trip. That is absolutely not something that Reloop supports. We have to make it easy. We believe that retailers have a role. We also know that there's technology that can make it really, really easy for retailers where they don't have to uh, involve a lot of their um, labor force into managing the systems that technology can do it for them. So um, incentives for retailers, well, it starts with a handling fee, a handling fee. And there are handling fees in most deposit return systems today. Um, some not. Germany is a different, it's, it's slightly a different story, but in general, handling fees do need to be paid to collectors. And if they're retailers, they should get a handling fee. And that can significantly offer them incentive. At the same time, I think we need to put pressure on retailers that they need to take greater responsibility for the products that they sell, that they should be investigating reuse opportunities where possible. Things like I said at the beginning, um, bulk distribution of foods that are good for bulk distribution, dry foods, dog foods, pastas, nuts, beans, et cetera. And they should also look at reusable um, asset packaging like transportation packaging at retailers. Uh, they should all be using as much as possible reusable transportation packaging um, and be involved in these reusable pooling systems. Uh, and they should also carry refillable bottles period. Um, I don't think we're going to see national mandates forcing like we had in Germany. Uh, it's a very unpopular policy because it's difficult politically, but it is certainly what is needed to truly make a difference is if we had refillable quotas combined with a deposit system where people can return them. That's when you'll start to see producers say, ah, okay, there's a deposit system. I can get my stuff back. I could actually put out a refillable bottle and I could get real economic benefit from that bottle where they can actually save money as a producer by putting out a perfect bottle over and over and only having to pay for it once. Thank you very much, Carissa, for this very comprehensive answer. Um, there's a few more questions uh, for you in the chat and Clarissa may have a chance to answer some of them in, uh, in writing uh, while we move on. Uh, we've actually heard the name uh, of the country Germany quite a few times already uh, in this webinar. And there's a reason for that is that there's indeed uh, a, a, a system there we can learn uh, a lot from. Uh, and Tobias will 
uh, well, we share his experience there. Um, so Tobias is a director of public affairs, sustainability and communications of the cooperative of the German mineral water companies, uh, which runs the Europe's uh, biggest refillable uh, bottle system uh, with more than 1 billion bottles and uh, more than 1 million crates. Um, to Tobias is also the CEO of the Working Group Refillables, uh, which is an organization that is uh, managing the European refillable logo. Uh, he will explain a bit more uh, about that. Um, the floor is yours, Tobias, thank you. Well, thank you very much. So just let me share my screen. So do you see the presentation now? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me here today. And, and um, well, it's, uh, you said, and uh, Justine, in the beginning, um, to make um, refillables the norm. I think we can also think it a little bit the way, uh, let get it back to the norm because refillables were in place all the time. And, um, Maybe it's a little piece of luck in Germany that we were a little bit slower um, as we are um, still having quite a successful um, refillable system. I'm sorry here for the sound, um, but okay, I think it's solved. Um, okay, so let's jump um, um, to the presentation. Um, I think you gave already a perfect introduction. So, so I think there's nothing to add. So, so we have one organization where I'm working with. This is the cooperative of the German Mineral Waters, an organization that's um, already um, many years out there. We are actually nonprofit in the sense that all the German mineral water companies are um, actually our owners. So, um, um, the system we are running is in the ownership of the companies. Um, and we're around 50 people here in, in the group um, headquarters in Bonn in Germany. And the second organization I'm with is what uh, Justine just mentioned, the Refillable Working Group. And we are running this logo, um, which you will find on, actually it's, it's um, 210, 215 companies now. So, so the growth quite, uh, is quite um, fast right now with uh, more than 600 brands. And you'll find that logo mainly in Germany on refillable bottles and other co food containers, but now also in Austria, in France. So, so we're trying to expand in Europe as the refillable idea is also growing. If you look, and by the way, um, um, GDB, the cooperative is one of the co-founders of the Refillable Working Group. So that's the reason why I have those two hats. Um, so, so there is an integration. If you think about the German market, um, there's one thing that, that's pretty important and maybe also one of the reasons why we are pretty successful in running um, the, the refillable systems. We have a very rich um, um, regional structure of um, um, breweries, mineral water companies, and, and other soft drink and fruit juice producers all over the country. Um, and the second thing is uh, most of the beverages, beer, mineral water, soft drinks are sold in crates. So, so you don't buy a six pack, you don't buy it bottle by bottle, you buy, for example, a crate of 12 mineral water bottles or a crate of 20 or 24 beer bottles. And that's the way you go shopping once a week or even um, all two weeks and then you just return the crate and you get it. So that's the structural specific things. And we have a system of gross retailers and specialized beverage retailers here. Um, and, and which is also very helpful as you will see. Um, and, and whenever we think about translating the German model to other countries, we have to keep this in mind, but well, the easy answer or the short answer on this is, is it's doable. You can also translate many things of what we do here to other countries. And for, last but not least, it's about 150,000 green jobs tied to the system in the entire country. Now, if we think about 
um, um, well, beverage containers, and that absolutely relates to what you saw um, 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 in Clarissa's presentation, um, because it when you had this taxonomy of different refillable or reusable packaging, this now is more specifically going into beverage containers, um, which um, 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 uh, Clarissa um, mentioned as returnable packaging. And um, it's a rather difficult slide, but <laughs> I will guide you through. And, and once, if you understand what's written here, you will get everything you need to know about um, refillable beverage containers. So the first question always is, made, is it made of PT? Is it glass or is it a can? Um, and and um, it's pretty clear only a PT bottle or a glass bottle can be a refillable. Um, and that's very important to tell you. Um, we have, it's not only glass, it's also PT refill, what we have here in Germany. And there are always several issues and questions um, um, tied to, to each of these questions. For example, um, if you're thinking about um, a pack, uh, a packaging of, for beer in Germany, you won't be able to sell it in a PT bottle. It's almost the natural thing if uh, it uh, meant if it's meant to be a refillable, it has to be a glass bottle. Um, the next question is, is it single use or is it refill? Of course, that's the most important thing. And um, um, it's a matter of customer preferences. It's also a matter, of course, do you want to be positioned as a um, 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 sustainable company? Um, but it's also, of course, a question, um, for example, tied to, to where do you want to get your products listed? So we have in Germany still um, discounter uh, um, companies not listing reuse bottles. So the, uh, politically, it's one of our goals to, to change this, to have it available everywhere. Um, but I also marketing questions like um, glasses associated with high quality and this ends up usually in a higher price. So also this could be to, to pick up one of the questions to Clarissa, an incentive for retailers. Um, 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 basically um, reuse could also mean better prices. And then we have a, uh, if we have a refill bottle, there are two different systems. One is so-called individual refill, uh, refillables and pool refillables. And the difference here is, um, a pool bottle is a bottle that's used by or shared by many companies. So for example, we have a mineral water bottle in the German market, um, which is shared by um, about um, 140 companies, all using the same bottle. And as you can imagine, this is very, very efficient because you can sell a bottle or fill a bottle in, in somewhere in, in the south of Germany and you sell it in the north and it could be refilled in the north. There is no transport needed back um, to the um, place of origin. So you can use it all over the country. And, and, but of course, there are also some issues associated to such a pool system because you have to cooperate somehow with your competitors. But actually the pool system is the successful system we have here in Germany. I will show you in a few minutes how this works. And the, the other option is to have an individual refillable bottle, for example, with a branded uh, a branding, a logo or whatever on the bottle. And this could be used only by the company issuing this bottle. Um, and this is still in environmental terms, um, um, a very sustainable solution, but it, it's definitely associated with a little more cost, but for example, you are managing your own system. And finally, if you have a pool bottle system, there are two um, um, variations here. We have so-called unmanaged systems, and that's basically, uh, and I will show you how um, that those bottles are in the market and, and just returned um, 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 on its, in its circle and, and the managed system is that you have certain rules on it. And actually what we have at GDB is a managed pool system. And actually it's 
many people call it really the full system for beverage containers. It's, it's in many respects, um, 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 probably the best running system here. This system, and that's what Justine already mentioned, we have um, a market share of about 40% uh, in the mineral water market in Germany. If you, we think about reuse, it's, it's more than 70%. Um, we have about 6.8 billion bottles filled per year. It's more than 1 billion bottles in the market. And um, it's a system used by more than 140 companies and, and more than 400 brands. And this is a very conservative estimate. And, and what does the management actually mean? Management means we have a legal framework for the bottlers. I told you a pool system will always mean you have to cooperate with competitors. And of course, life is much easier if you have a legal framework, if you have a balanced system of inputs and ejects, um, and, and shared responsibility for all the bottlers, um, because this means a fair sharing of benefits and duties. Um, and, and this is really very important to run such a pool system. And, and um, um, we have clearing activities. Of course, we have also shared services like market analysis and so on. But, but this, all this results in a system that's working now for more than 50 years, very successfully. Um, and so it's not a pretty new idea. It's out there already for decades. And, and we have many variations within the system. So we have small bottles, we have big bottles, we have different kinds of crates. It's PT and glass, as I told you. And, and, just, um, and, and we just introduced um, new bottles two years ago. This is very successful. We have new companies using this system. So, so, um, um, it's running pretty well. And just to give you an idea, there's also an unmanaged system, and that's what we find in the German beer market and in um, big parts of the carbonated soft drink market um, with many, many different bottles. And now, if you hear unmanaged, you will ask, and actually we have no numbers because it's unmanaged. Nobody knows exactly how many bottles are out there. There are estimates, maybe it's 1.5 billion, maybe it's a lot less, maybe more, nobody knows. And, and there are some initiatives um, rethinking this. Um, and and um, I'm pretty sure we will see in the next two, three years, um, some kind of management also in this system. And if you ask the question now, how does this work? What does it mean even for unmanaged systems? Um, that's the, well, the secret of why um, everything works here. It's, it's actually, we have no centralized management in a sense that someone controls the whole process. What happens here is we have a very decentralized structure, what I call um, a combination of, of self-interest because everybody has the interest to, well, um, on, on downstream to sell the bottles, to bring it uh, um, uh, to, to retailers, um, to consumers, they want to buy good products. And then in a the moment where the bottle is empty, there's the deposit on the bottle. And this makes you having an interest to return the bottle because you want to have your um, 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 deposit back. and and. As this is established now for decades, it's actually what I call an the invisible hand at work. Um, um, it's we, um, of course we, we need a lot of um, um, clearing here, but but basically there is no central um, 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 organization to steer the system. It's managed by self-interest. And what is managed is, for example, um, quality management um, and so on, what I told, and, and shared burden. For example, you have to bring in a certain amount, a percentage of bottles every year in the system in order to keep the quality of the bottles high. So, but the circle here you see here, this is not managed. It's really, um, well, uh, steered by experience and self-interest and established structures. 
And what you see here might remind you of the butterfly graphic Clarissa showed you a few uh, minutes ago. And that's uh, to me, but of course the meaning here is, is a different one. Um, actually, um, it's important to, to notice a refillable bottle will be always recycled. If it's a glass bottle or if it's a PT bottle, there's a second life for all refillable bottles. So basically the difference here is before recycling, it's circulated up to 50 times. And that's the important message here. And okay, I'm, I'm running out of time. So I will jump through the last slides very quickly, just to give you an idea. Um, the market shares of refillables in Germany are very different. Beer is very high, soft drinks very low. But here, you, for example, you see Coca-Cola just introduced um, uh, last, no, two weeks ago, a new refillable bottles in, in Germany, and, and this will change this um, number here um, definitely. In mineral water, we have a rising market share of, especially of glass refill, so this number is going up. So, so even if Clarissa and I absolutely agree to, to Clarissa's number, that we have a general trend. Um, of growing um, single-use PT and, and um, 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 decreasing numbers of glass refill in the German market is currently different. And if you ask me why, that's definitely consumers that are more interested in um, sustainable packaging. And this, because it's a relatively new trend, it's the last two years. Um, Deposits, I will skip this. It's, it's just to give you an idea. You have the uh, presentation later on. So, so that's what, what now the deposits in the German market. Last thing, most important, and Clarissa also said it, simplicity to the customer is the most important thing if you want to have a smoothly running refillable system. It can be complicated in the background or even for corporations and companies, it's much easier if it's simple, but, but you need some rules, as I said. But to consumers, it must be simple in order to work. And um, I will skip this slide here, and because we, of course we have issues and challenges, but the last thing I want to share with you, it's not only beverages. So the new trend we see here in Germany is other stuff sold in glass pool uh, packaging, for example, rice, nuts, tea, and so on. Coffee, I just received a sample this week of, of coffee in a, in a um, um, 500 grand bottle. It's the same principle here at work. It's a pool in glass um, container and, and it can be returned in every retail uh, in, uh, that have a, um, a reverse vending machine. It's growing. We are just collecting numbers and I hope to have some numbers end of this month because it's, it's huge. It's, it's really a very, very exciting development here. And, and um, I'm pretty sure that we can learn from this experience also in other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias, for the presentation. Uh, very, uh, there's a lot to learn from your experience. Also really good to also see some numbers behind some concrete examples. Um, and also you mentioned quite a lot, uh, the, some elements linked to economics and jobs, which I think are also very interesting. Um, also uh, very positive to hear uh, that it's going beyond beverage and there's definitely interest there. And I think we'll go back to that uh, in the last discussion because I think there's really this question of how, the, for example, the German pool system could be used for other type of products, etc. But I suggest we take that with the full group. Maybe um, for you from the questions that, that were asked, um, one question was asked about the um, energy use and the water use. And, and I saw quickly on, on your on your slide that you're also doing work on, on carbon emissions and, and reducing carbon emissions. Maybe you want to say a word about this? Well, it basically, if, um, um, if you ask about um, um, the cleaning process of, of refillables, um, and actually the numbers Clarissa showed you uh, um, also regarding LCAs, 
of course you need water, you need heat to clean the bottles, but this is calculated in every LCA comparing different packaging systems. So um, um, if we talk about um, a glass bottle being refilled for 50 times, it will definitely travel longer ways than a single use bottle, but it's still um, 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 better in environmental terms um, than a single use bottle. So, so that's the short answer. The long answer would be, let's do a seminar about LCAs next time and then look at deeper into the numbers. But um, trust me, um, the numbers um, are out there since, since decades and they all prove, even though we know um, um, that um, at least some of the single use systems are catching up. Um, and the second question was, um, oh yeah, um, becoming carbon neutral. That's easily put, um, of course, we said we are not bad in environmental terms, but what's next? And, and what's our biggest problem? That's definitely climate change. So what can we do? And um, this is actually, it's the first time in my life that I, uh, I'm part of a team of a project that's running for 10 years. We started it last year. And, and the, the goal here is to have a carbon neutral production of our refillables. And of course, you can imagine that's a lot of talks um, with the glass industry, um, the PT uh, producers with the companies producing the crates. And, and the first steps we took now is of course, re, um, uh, rethinking um, transport because that's, well, the low hanging fruit here. Um, the next step is um, 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 discussing um, with um, the glass and PT companies um, how they can reduce their emissions. And basically for us, it will also mean we are going to source at those companies that have the better performance in environmental um, 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 terms. Um, but at this point, it's, it's a very cooperative um, process because all the companies, they have the same interest. And, and um, we are actually in part of our pool already carbon neutral by offsetting our emissions, but that's not the goal. The goal here is really um, to become net zero. This will take quite a few years, but um, that uh, was actually the decision of the, our entire industry here, of the um, mineral water companies here in Germany to, to become carbon neutral by 2030. And this means definitely for packaging and, and our systems are for mineral water and also for um, carbonated soft drinks. We will be definitely car be carbon neutral by 2030 latest. Maybe a little bit faster, I don't know yet. Thank you. So that's Tobias. the new thing, yep. That's, uh, that's great to hear and maybe there will be a lot to learn there as well when things are also maybe used for other sectors and, and can be replicated as well. Maybe a very quick question before we move on. Um, because there was a question on, and you mentioned simplicity for citizens is key. And there was a question on, but if we all go into reusable systems, uh, is there not gonna be a queue, for example, when you want to end out your, your reusable bottles? But my understanding, for example, from Germany with the DRS system, with both single use and, and reuse, it's that it, it usually works quite well and, and doesn't create like issues. Maybe you can share a few sentences about this. Oh, uh, yes, um, um, it's it's running quite well, and in, in um, but that's the point. What also Clarissa mentioned: um, if you have any point of sale, um, taking also the bottles, it's much easier than having just a few um, redemption centers or whatever, um, um, because that might lead to problems. And and well. There's one more thing we have to think about, which is, um, well, well, many of my friends in, in working in the refill, but they don't like to hear that. But, but I think we have to be very frank and open on that. We can't do everything in reuse and refillable. We have to be always critical and we have to put always the critical question, does it make sense to put it in a refillable container? 
and we have many, many products. And as the examples I showed you from the food sector are very clear, they are a huge, there's a huge potential, but not everything. It's always that we have to put the critical question is maybe in some cases, is it, it could be better to have a single use packaging, but there are so many products we can put in refillables and we should go this way in terms of logistics and, and queuing up. And so I don't see any problems. You put up just um, another um, reverse vending machines. Um, this could be organized. Uh, I can only, well, once we are beyond COVID, invite everybody to come to Germany and, and uh, just to take a look. And, and maybe we, at one point we can organize also kind of a tour for those who are interested, um, because of course we can show lots of videos, but sometimes it's better to have it tangible and take a look at it, it just works. And it's experience, definitely. Um, um, it's, uh, for German consumers, it's, it's a learned system. We don't have to explain it. Um, and that's also part of um, um, the secret, of course, if we think about it, bringing it to other markets where consumers are not that experienced with refillable, it needs some explanation. But as Clarissa mentioned once, we have those systems and DRS systems in place. That's half of the journey done, maybe even more. Because in this case, when once we have this um, 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 deposit systems established and the point of return established, it's not a question to have a single user um, um, refill. And my answer is, of course, once you have the system in place, go for refillables. Thank you, Tobias. And I think we'll uh, pick up that conversation later also on which products, which market segment may be the best to, uh, to, to uh, switch to reuse as well and maybe already ready to do that. Um, and before we, we go uh, there, we'll have the third presentation uh, from Inge. We'll uh, present a few more examples uh, from across Europe and, and good practices. Um, so Inge has been working on environmental issues since 2015, um, and she used to be the coordinator of the Belgium NGO Arbeid and Milieu. And since uh, 2017, she works as a project manager and campaign coordinator at the Dutch-Belgium uh, NGO Recycling Network Benelux. Um, she had led um, a successful deposit alliance campaign, uh, which brought together uh, more than 1,000 uh, organizations across the Netherlands and Belgium, as well as companies and municipalities, in uh, pushing for a national DRS system, both on cans and on bottles. Um, today, Inge is uh, committing really and working towards accelerating the transition from disposable packaging to uh, visible, accessible and affordable reusable systems. Um, and uh, she co-initiated the Mission Reuse, uh, which is uh, basically a program that tastes uh, and scales up um, innovations, innovative solutions and, and advocate for uh, reusable, reuse favorable policies, both at the local and national um, level. Um, Inge, the floor is yours. Thanks, Justine, for the introduction. And um, well, good to not see you all, but good to have you all here. Um, thanks, Clarissa and Tobias, for the already very interesting talks. I hope I can add something to that. There will be a little bit of repetition, probably, uh, but hopefully that will just help to uh, to get the message to stick in all of your heads. Um, so yeah, I'd like to share some of my thoughts and the work that we're doing on how we hope to sort of unlock a reuse revolution together and to um, set the scene a little bit. Um, what we're working on is that while single-use plastics were introduced in the markets around in the 50s as this already mentioned very convenient solution for the busy housewife so you don't have to clean it or you don't have to bring it back to the store but it's very easy easy to use and now over the past five six decades we've grown a culture in that uh, well when we use something and it doesn't have any value of us anymore we just simply throw it away um, 
I'm not going to get into all the details. I don't have to explain to you probably all the social and environmental challenges that come with this disposability, uh, like the extensive resource use, uh, emissions, waste management problems, and, and littering. Um, but it's really important, I think, to realize that we've really grown this disposable mindset, and it's a really strong part of our culture and our way of living. And I just wanted to show you a 30 second video clip that really captures this culture shift of the last few decades from disposables. So that's, that's where we are now at the moment. We have a disposable mindset in our daily lives, but also in our business models. And um, I don't want to show it to you again. Yeah, here we go. Uh, in, our, in our policies as well. And this was already mentioned by Clarissa quite clearly, but um, uh, this, this disposable mindset actually leads us to the focus of separating waste and recycling. But in the end, uh, that is not a true circular economy, as Clarissa already explained. If we want to be really circular, we must rethink our use of packaging and products and keep them as long as possible in, in their function before we even consider throwing them away and, and, and recycle the materials. So I think it's really challenged to get our culture, our narrative shift from disposable to start thinking about reduction and reuse of packaging and, 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 and products. And for that reason, um, we from, well, from Recycling Network uh, started a program together with two other Dutch organizations called NVU, which is a venture builder and another nonprofit called Nature and Environment. And this program is called Mission Reuse. And it's, well, our dream is that at some point, the fast moving consumer goods, so thinking about coffee cups, uh, food containers, but also diapers or grocery packaging, uh, for all of these fast moving consumer goods that we shortly use and then dispose of that reuse will become the new normal and we're really interested by the question like how can these reuse systems and practices become part of the mainstream become part of people's everyday lives and how can we make them visible affordable accessible as both Claire and Tobia, Tobia said it's really really important that reuse systems are um, simple and convenient for for the users so in our program, we look at this, uh, this challenge from a transition perspective, um, where in order to, to, uh, to that ch for that change to appear, we need to build up new, our new uh, ideal world, but we need to break down also the old ones, the disposable mindset. And there are several components that we need to look at in order to, to, get, to, that, to get the transition going. Uh, we need to look at innovations and solutions, but we also need a regime shift. We need policies that enable and push for reuse and refill. And we need this cultural narrative shift. We need to understand that disposable is not normal anymore and reuse is. Um, so I quickly want to dive into a little bit of, uh, of these components. Um, so first of all, yes, we need alternative reuse and refill business models. There's already some wonderful examples in the world as you have heard. Um, we do need to ask people to keep bringing their own cups and their own food containers if they go for takeaway. But in the end, this is really something for the environmentally concerned, the ones who want to take a bit, little bit extra effort, but it's not very convenient. And we cannot trust that everyone, kind of believe that everyone is, is willing to, uh, to do it in that way, to bring their own. So to make reuse big and scale, we need new systems, which make it as convenient as possible and also financially interesting uh, for, for those stakeholders uh, to, in, uh, in the chain to, uh, to collaborate. So what we do, do need to do is we need to test. Uh, here are three examples of tests that we did ourselves and uh, Packback is a Dutch organization who's doing some wonderful tests as well. For example, with meal containers in different contexts, in different circumstances, how do we get these containers to return? How high does a deposit needs to be? Does it actually need a deposit or do we maybe need a fine if you don't bring it back? What works better? 
how much technology do you need and actually to make this, uh, these systems work? Um, so testing is really important, I think, to, to start to understand what kind of reuse systems can actually work. But then indeed, we already see a lot of solutions popping up all around us. Uh, in the beverage sector is a very wonderful example, but also indeed the dispensers and supermarkets for food, also online grocery shopping or online shopping for other e-commerce uh, or takeaway for delivery of food. But let's be honest, these are still all niche solutions. They're very small in scale and uh, often have a hard time to exist and to grow. And um, yeah, we talked to quite some companies and asked them what the challenges that you're facing. And I think in the end, it all comes down to this one thing that I started with that our society has a disposable mindset. So our way of living, our business models, our policies, everything is focused on this disposability. So setting up a new business model uh, completely against this, this, this idea, it takes well research to figure out what works best. It takes time, it takes uh, investments in new packaging, but also new logistics, cleaning in redistribution and all these kinds of things. Uh, and it adds new operational costs to system. So the challenges of these reuse and refill businesses is that there's a lot yeah, of competition from the cheaper and easier to use disposables. And it's really hard to compete with that and scale up. Um, as well as I mentioned that there's a very low engagement from public authorities to raise awareness and to encourage actually to take up reuse options. Uh, because there's still so much focus on, on recycling. Um, so we believe that the barriers can not only be tackled by just figuring out what the new innovations will be, what the new solutions are, the new business models are, but we also definitely need, definitely need strong legislation to steer the society into this direction. Um, that definitely starts at the EU level. There's a single-use plastics directive and some other directives which gradually start to focus on reuse more. Um, and we also believe that next there's a very important role for national decision makers. They can definitely make a difference in their country by prioritizing uh, reuse and refill as part of a truly circular economy. And it actually in the end comes down to three things that they can do. They can set ambitious targets or obligations to support reuse, um, but they can also facilitate and encourage uh, reuse businesses for example, by economic incentives or information sharing. Um, and last but not least, uh, authorities can also lead the way in a transition, for example, by adopting green public procurement policies that prioritize reuse services. Um, just three, three examples of um, countries who are already doing an, a very interesting job in this is, uh, for example, Flanders, part of a big part of Belgium, uh, they put a ban on disposable cups and on uh, food containers at municipalities. Um, in France, there's now a law under debate to obligate larger supermarkets to dedicate 20% of their surface to space, um, a surface space to food refill stations. And in Germany, um, they're talking about, or I think they actually already approved a law that uh, restaurants, bistros, cafes have to offer a reuse packaging alternative if they are selling uh, food and drinks on the go. So uh, yeah, if you wanna know more about what national policy or national authorities can do to, um, to push for more reuse, I think uh, Rosella is putting a, a link in the um, chat at the moment with a, uh, a guide written by the Rethink Plastic Alliance, which is part of the Break Free From Plastic movement. Um, so we need these national laws, but it can take quite a lot of time and regulation is often slow. We also need to show bottom up that things are possible. Here's just three municipalities who are showing that they can play a very important role in a transition to reuse. The city of Leiden in the Netherlands um, have a ban on disposable cups in city events and every, everyone has to use a deposit system for reusable cups uh, on city events. In Tübingen, they even imposed a, a local tax on single-use food and drink packaging. And in Leuven in Belgium, uh, there's a financial support for families who want to use reusable nappies. So sum it up, it's great. There are options or opportunities. We know that there are innovative, uh, innovative solutions, and we know that we can figure out what works best in which context, but there's still a lot of barriers and uh, policies play an important role to accelerate the process, this transition. Um, and finally, so 
where we're now at is I think that we need to show what's possible. We need everyone to get to see this, get them on board and start doing it, start transitioning to reuse. Um, and that's something what we're working on together with the Break Free from Plastic movement with over a hundred European uh, uh, environmental organizations. We recently launched a campaign, We Choose Reuse. And um, with the campaign, we aim to let the voices all in favor of reuse be heard, show the opportunities, show the barriers and push for stronger policies uh, and challenge companies as well as retailers and restaurants to switch to uh, reuse systems. Um, at uh, wechoosereuse.com, uh, yeah, you're very welcome to, uh, to sign uh, the petition as well. You can sign it as an individual, you can sign it as an NGO, but you can also sign it if you are running a refill or reuse business and um, yeah, you want to you want to support that your business can grow and that we need better policies. Um, later this year, this campaign will move forward and will uh, present all these voices uh, to the policymakers on EU and national levels. So I think I'll leave you with that. Uh, invite you to join us, starting to uh, accelerate this transition to reuse. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Inge, and uh, so great to hear about, um, you know, policy, good policies and, and the role of policy makers, very important points. Uh, as a maybe direct uh, follow up to your presentation, in one of the first slides where you were presenting the different pilots, uh, there are, I noticed there was one on with Deliveroo in Assault, I think, in Flanders, um, and considering the situation we are in uh, for a year, we've seen the increase of takeaway um, and takeaway packaging. Uh, but I would say even beyond the, co uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we are in a society that tends to uh, use takeaway more and more. Um, so is there any lesson learned that you could share from, from this pilot that you did uh, with Deliveroo in, uh, in Flanders? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we did a, did a pilot last year. It ended earlier than we wanted to because of COVID. But in the end, you see that the takeaway business and the delivery business indeed is, is taking up uh, since this whole uh, pandemic. Um, yeah, what we what we learned from that, but also looking at a lot of other systems for, for um, uh, reusable food containers for delivery and takeaway is that in general, the public is quite open to it. Of course, there's always these early adopters, the ones who are already aware of it, but I think that's the one, the public that we need to start with. They're quite open and they're very positive uh, because they, they, they're they they're fed up with all the, the garbage that they're collecting if they order food. Um, people are very much in favor of deposit. We we asked them, do you prefer pay deposit uh, before when you, when you do the, when you do the uh, order or maybe afterwards? So you got to fine if you don't bring it back. Most people are actually in favor of a deposit system, I think also because they know it, because they know it from maybe beer bottles or uh, other beverages. Um, and um, what I think we also learned is, um, yes, it needs to be convenient, as convenient as possible to the customer. There's some tests, we didn't do those, but there's some tests also now with drop box, drop off boxes. So customers don't need to go back to the restaurant to bring back the container, but actually it's gonna be much easier maybe at supermarkets or other central places that they can drop off the boxes. So I think that that's very interesting to see how these logistics can even be, be better and more convenient. Um, but I also believe it's really much of um, selling your product as well. So good marketing, good communication to customers is really important. And maybe to, to round it, wrap that up is that for the restaurants, um, a lot of restaurants are really resistant to step into pilots like this, into um, trialing this, especially in these circumstances now where it's really hard time for any restaurant to just you know, stay alive. Their focus is on something different, which is very logical. Um, but then if they're joining, they're actually really like it and they know that it's, it's, they're, they're, don't, they're not um, producing that much waste. Uh, and they really like the system, as long as it is convenient for them as well, it should be easy for them as well. That's also really important. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, and maybe to pick up a little bit on the conversation we had earlier, and I think I will also invite Clarissa and, and Tobias maybe to get their views also on this one. Um, so we've seen a number of examples. Um, so far, it's true that it's been a lot about beverages and a bit more now 
considering about food containers, but that's very new. Um, the pooling system we've seen in, in Germany is really about beverages. Uh, what is your take on which sectors uh, could be next? Like what, what beyond beverages? Uh, we already know within beverages, it's not all beverages, but you know, all beverages, beyond beverages, what are the sectors that would um, make sense or are ready for, for this change? And maybe linked to that, what is the role of standardization of packaging in that? Like how having a certain number of formats for packaging could help those pool systems or those reusable systems? Uh, and maybe Inga, you wanna go first and then Tobias and Clarissa, if you wanna add from your experience. Yeah, yeah, like I think the examples that I already gave are, um, the, the takeaway sector, the food sector is really something that's booming, that has a lot of uh, environmental impact and, uh, and a lot of, uh, um, how do you say, a turnover, a lot, of, a lot of products going on in there, a lot of packaging. So I think that those are definitely the ones, but also already talked about supermarkets, refillable systems in, systems in, food, in the supermarkets for certain types of food. Definitely agree with Tobias that not everything uh, can or should go in reusables, but definitely a lot of things, detergents or certain food items, we can definitely start working on reusable systems in the supermarkets, retail there. Uh, and the role of standardization, um, yeah, I think I think in the end, standardization, as you see again in the German example, is really important to scale up systems and to, uh, to make them bigger. And so just to make them also uh, compatible with the disposable uh, alternatives. Um, but in the but for for the food containers and the cups, for example, maybe cups were starting to get there. But we also need to figure out the systems first before we actually can make that step into standardization. So I think um, in some cases it will take a little while before we get there. But I think it's important for scale up. But definitely happy to hear what Tobias and uh, Clarissa think about that. Well, maybe I can just add a few things. Um, <clears throat> I think that we have an interesting opportunity arising now with the online delivery distribution of, of groceries. Um, there's a beautiful reverse logistics opportunity there where the delivery of full goods can take back empties. Um, it couldn't be easier for the customer. So I think that especially with COVID that that whole online distribution has increased dramatically we should take advantage of that and start really thinking about refillable systems. And it requires, you know, talking to these companies that are selling online and trying to sort of work with them to incorporate that into their operations, that reverse piece that they often don't do. Um, so that's a really interesting opportunity. I think that in terms of the new products, um, some of them are an expanding, uh, will be an expanding growing market share. When we think of transportation packaging, like I showed you earlier, I mean, so many of these transportation packaging uh, methods are so much more efficient than non-reusable goods that we're almost at that point now where I think the European Commission is actually seriously considering a bans on certain single-use packaging and it may even start with, let's just say, as an idea, this is my idea, this is, I didn't hear it from them, but why do we have single-use pallets on the market today? irrespective of the material, whether they're wood or plastic, they can be refurbished, reconstituted. The idea of a single use pallet is insane today. Um, there are other examples of large scale reusables that I think um, we should just be wiping out of the marketplace. Another very interesting example is something that we don't talk about much because it's not consumer packaging, but it's large like appliance packaging which is often cardboard and styrofoam, expanded polystyrene, which is not banned from the EU, only polystyrene takeout containers. Um, these are the kinds of really interesting things where if you, if you have a reusable, large reusable, rigid, strong, protective reusable container for fridges and ovens and these kinds of things, you can actually design a fridge and an oven with much less weight and materials because you don't have to protect it because they're often built that way to protect them during shipping. Once you put your fridge and in your insert in your kitchen, it's done. So we're talking about a fundamental shift in the way we design big energy intensive products to become less energy intensive by focusing on reusable smart packaging to protect them so we can reduce, uh, do real reduction. So that's also a very interesting piece. It's not as topical because it's more on the um, B2B 
or the industrial side of things. Um, and then, yeah, everything that everyone else is talking about. Coffee cups are really exciting. We're hearing about it everywhere. Um, Non-food packaging is obviously a much easier one. It makes a lot of sense. So um, I think it's really about, as Tobias said, you know, it maybe not makes sense in all cases. We have to figure out what are the low hanging fruit? Where does it really make sense? Refillable bottles, no bar or restaurant or catering company should be distributing non-reusable beverage containers, frankly. There's no reason for that. So that would be sort of a starting point. I would say with Horeca, if we're talking about targets from a policy perspective, let's start with Horeca. Horeca being hotels, restaurants, bars. Um, these are some of the low hanging fruits and then the rest will sort of come if we can build some economies of scale with those low hanging fruits. Tobias, what are some of the new products? What do you think? Well, I, I think um, that pretty much relates to what you just said. So I tend to think there's several variables. Um, so one is, um, um, I think everything that's packed in single use glass could be easily also thought as refillable. Um, number two is um, it's a matter of, of how fast the product get, gets consumed. So how fast will the packaging return? To give you an example, that's, that's my typical exam, example I, I also use here in Germany. If I have a very good bottle of Bordeaux wine where I know this is going to be stored in my cellar for another 10 years refillable won't make so much sense. But if it's a product that's used up in, in two weeks, three weeks at home, it should be refillable. Yeah, so, so the variable here is, is, is um, um, how fast um, um, is it consumed? Another variable is, is um, and really this, this um, is it local, is it um, um, so, so what's the, the um, way it's transported? And if you add up those kind of variables, I think you get a very easy to understand algorithm, what's next. And, and that's why I end up, for example, um, 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 we have um, detergents um, and uh, it's actually a company in, in Northern Germany that's just started this year um, uh, glass refill system for hand soaps. And actually they had other things in mind, but <laughs> due to COVID, they have also now a disinfection um, 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 gel for hands. And it's, it's glass refillable and you just return it in, in um, um, a reverse vending machine. It's the same uh, machine where you return your bottles. So, so, um, and that's the way how, how I would say it's, it's really um, easy to, to develop what I call the search algorithm for refillable packaging. Um, and there may be some more variables um, to add, but, but um, that's the way I tend to think about it. And, and um, what I also I have quite a few discussions with startup companies here in Germany, they ask these kind of questions. And, and I always tell them, think about it this way and you end up with the products that are next to be in refillable in an efficient and, and sustainable way. Thank you all. Um, plenty of ideas and thanks to develop for sure in, in many sectors, um, but very interesting to see also what type of kind of conditions and, and criteria you're looking at to, to identify those sectors that, that may make the, the most sense. Um, one important uh, element that came out a few times in the question as well is the hygiene issue and, and the sanitization. Um, and so maybe Tobias, you want to start on this one, but basically what's your experience with ensuring the sanitization of the beverage bottles, both glass and plastic? There was also a question on plastic because of course we know that plastic degrades with time as well. So um, it could be useful to have your experience. And of course, if Inger and Clarissa, you want to add something as well. Well, basically um, um, now, nowadays um, um, hygiene is not a problem at all, neither glass or um, PT, because um, you have quality insurance. Um, so, so for example, you have, it's called the sniffer. It's an electronic nose that, for example, checks every bottle after it's cleaned um, 
So in order to, to for example, it, it's um, if you ha have a mineral water bottle and someone filled fruit juice in it, you can't use it for um, um, mineral water anymore because there might be uh, the rest of, of, well, if you had it, for example, apple juice, it might influence the, the um, taste of the mineral water, but an electronic um, system would identify it. And so there's, we don't see any issues in terms of hygiene. And this, by the way, answers one of the questions someone had here in, in, in the um, 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 question and answer section. Um, it's actually, the bottles are not, there's no central organization where the bottles are cleaned. It's always cleaned at the producer. And this, by this, you get rid of another problem. If you want to have a central uh, place to clean the bottles, which in maybe some cases might make sense, but in most cases, you will end up in the problem of hygienic storage of the clean container and hygienic transport of the container. This makes no sense. It's much easier to have it at the spot in terms if it's about beverages. The process is clean the bottle, and refill it immediately. So there's one line, cleaning and producing and filling. Um, um, and that's um, 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 also, um, um, it's not only in terms of logistic, the best way, it's also in terms of hygiene, the best way. And um, so it was a very interesting uh, um, because those kind of questions, of course, came up when the COVID pandemic started. People asked us, hey, what about um, safety and hygiene in, in these cases? It's no issue anymore. So, so I know, um, well, it's a matter of trust also. So, so in Germany, it's easy. I think almost nobody thinks about it. We had these kind of questions in the, um, when the COVID pandemic started, but usually nobody asks a question like this because people are pretty much used that um, the systems are safe and they are. So um, that's um, everything I can say on that. So hygiene is, it's, it's, um, it's no issue. <laughs> Thank you, Tobias. Um, don't know if you don't want to comment on this one. Um, maybe um, on, um, on, um, sorry. I lost my uh, <laughs> thinking process uh, because there was also a new question coming. Um, but when, um, sorry, there was a question as well on how do you ensure um, then the relabeling of the, the system? So how, because then you have a pool system, how do you make sure then, then each company of course has access to its own marketing and branding again um, from your experience as well? Well, maybe I can step in here as a Canadian. Um, in Canada, we have uh, the brewers, the domestic brewers of Canada have come together years, seven years ago, and decided the best way that they could put beer on the market was to share a standard refillable beer bottle. And they collectively, as a group of highly comp competitive breweries, invested in a float of brown refillable bottles and they all market the exact same bottle with the one difference being the label. So when the bottles go empty and dirty, sorry about that, back to the brewery to be washed, they're actually getting in bottles that have all their competitors labels on it because they don't care about the labels. They just want the bottle back so they can wash it. The labels go off because they put labels on with the proper glue so they can easily wash off. And now they have sparkling, clean, beautiful brown bottles. And they put all their own Molson label or Coors label or Heineken or whatever the label is. Well, not Heineken, they're not using it, but, um, and so it goes. So the labeling isn't an issue. They just remove the old labels and they put new labels on and you get incredible efficiencies because it's a standard bottle. So you don't have to think about where do I ship it? And I got to put these in this case and these in this case, they all go in one case and they just get shipped to the brewers based on the smartest logistics at that time. And I think I think for other sectors, we can definitely learn so much from this. For example, if I'm thinking about the takeaway food or delivered food, um, 
uh, some of the, the restaurants really want the branded packaging, but a lot of them don't really care. They just buy any brown packaging at the moment or whatever plastic and, and they use it. But if they want branded, we can definitely learn from these, uh, these systems in place that we can use these stickers or we can use something, you know, non-toxic, wash off, whatever. Uh, so it can still be branded uh, and the packaging can still be standardized. So I think that's wonderful. I would absolutely agree to, to what both of you said. And the question is, you know, of course, the packaging, one of the functions of a packaging is selling. That's, that's definitely true. Um, and the point here is, what are you actually selling? Um, and so, so there's a point where, where um, um, it turns from selling a product to really selling only a packaging with, with a rather not so interesting product. And, and I always say, is I have this kind of discussions very often with also startup companies, but also with some of the bigger companies here in Germany, where they say, at least we need an individual um, um, refillable packaging in order to, to get our branding um, uh, better positioned and so on and so on. And that's, that's always use number one, the examples of the most exciting new beverage companies in Germany. The two that were the runner up in the, in the last decade, they sell their products only in pool bottles because the true story of their products is that they have exciting stories to tell. They have exciting tastes to sell. So, so it's really what's in the bottle. Um, and of course, they have um, good marketing and very nice labels. That's enough. Um, and um, um, the second that I answered this also in one of the um, questions. And, um, it's, it, I always tell um, um, also the, the um, chief of marketing of the bigger companies, if you invest and only a part of the money you will need to um, um, go into an individual um, um, refillable system in smart and good advertisement, you are better off. Um, um, because again, it's, it's a matter of, of the products you're selling, not so much of the packaging. So, um, and the last point on that would be um, packaging is of course also part of the message here. And I think in the current stage and, and what's coming in the next years, um, the message we are having a refillable packaging is more important than having a nice and very differentiating packaging. So you can go in a pool bottle with a good label and exciting label on it. And that's the message. We have a refillable because that's part of the sustainability message in branding, which is becoming more and more and more important. And if I could just add on that, Tobias, um, you know, we, we try to work a lot with industry at Reloop, trying to sort of bring together coalitions and uh, I'm hearing from some of the biggest beverage brands that exist on the planet. Some of the brands that you would have thought would never support reuse. I won't name them, but they're in the beer industry, the wine and spirit industry, and the non-alcohol industry and the water industry that are all seeing where they can get into the reuse market and how they can do it. And Tobias knows this very well because he's been getting a hell of a lot of inquiries lately from very big players. And I'm talking about in America too, believe it or not. So this is a global thing that's going on and um, we just need to continue to share information, share best in practice, um, communicate with Justine at Zero Waste Europe and Inga and Tobias and myself. We're all constantly talking to each other. We have a lot of resources. Tobias is really the, the master of the beverage container uh, system. So you're the man. But um, please reach out to this network because we can really help. And um, the brands want to do this. We need to help them figure out how to do it. Thank you very much, Clarissa. And this is a very uh, easy end over to me because we're getting close to the end of this uh, a very interesting webinar. It was really short. Um, thank you so much to the three of you uh, for your inspiring 
lesson learned and experience. Thank you all of you uh, behind the screen uh, for sharing this 90 minutes with us, for uh, asking a lot of questions. I'm sorry we couldn't take them all. Um, I think clearly there was a, a clear few message around uh, the fact that we indeed need to talk to each other and we also need to bring the retailers and the businesses on board and many of them are on board but more need to be on. Um, that we need to make it work for consumers and that will only be this way a success and that we also need to take maybe step by step and 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 also looking at what needs to be done from the design phase etc rather than just put products on the market but really thinking that uh, holistically uh, and the last thing you mentioned um, really Tobias about you know the role of the packaging etc and and if I imagine you know the the future with healthy food in in healthy and sustainable packaging uh, that's kind of uh, music to my ears so um that's that's really a definitely a, a good objective um one a few things i want to remind uh, everyone is that you can uh, find the um, presentation of uh, inge clarissa and tobias on uh, the waste uh, cities website my colleague is putting the link uh, in the chat um our next webinar uh, in the series would be on the 11th of May at 2 as well, uh, CET, and it will be around are we actually getting closer to a circular economy in Europe, so quite an interesting topic. Um, and if you want to know more about uh, the work Zero Waste Europe is doing uh, with cities um, to implement green really solutions at the local level, you can register to the cities newsletter and you will also know everything about those webinars. And finally, you will be able to rewatch uh, this great webinar on uh, YouTube again. Uh, my wonderful colleague will uh, share the link uh, in the Zoom. And if you're on YouTube at the moment, then uh, you, you were there already with us and you will be able to receive it there. Um, thank you so much uh, for this inspiring conversation. Uh, looking forward to continuing it um, and have a great afternoon.